All right, it says the meeting is now streaming live on Facebook. Henry, can you confirm? Um, nothing. I don't see anything yet on mine. I do. It is on. It's yes. on for you, okay. Awesome. No, but it's the streaming now. Streaming live. Yeah. Okay. Great, right. team. So we are going to get started. I call this meeting to order at 7.05 p.m. Good evening, everyone, and happy Thursday. Thank you for joining us this evening. I do want to acknowledge that our city manager is on this call and our city councilor, Leah Robinson. So thank you for joining us. Uh, we will begin with a Pledge of Allegiance. So team, please unmute yourself and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, America. 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 and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice, justice for, all. for all. Thanks, team. Go ahead and mute yourselves. As uh, our superintendent, Dr. Abeda, is getting, is queuing up our agenda. I do rem want to remind those who are watching, we do have translations available. Uh, para, para lo que están escuchando esta reunión en la casa, nosotros ten tenemos traducción. El número y el, bueno, el número de, del Zoom Room está debajo al final de la agenda de, de esta reunión. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Luz, for translating. Gracias a Luz que va a traducir esta reunión esta noche. We're, gonna go get, we're going to get started with a roll call for attendance. So, Veronica, I turn it over to you. Roll call for attendance. Ms. Enriquez. Yes. Ms. Santiago? Mr. Jimenez Rivera? Here. Ms. Alfaro? Here. Ms. Garcia Mirza? Here. Mr. Wilson? Present. Ms. Carlisle? Present. That's six members present and three absent. Thank you, Veronica. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes from the last meeting on February 4th? I make I a motion. The, meetings, the meeting minutes from February 4th. Do I have a second? <laughs> I second, second it. Third. Thanks so much, team. Veronica, do we have any public comments submitted for this evening? No, we do not. Thank you. Moving right along, I will now turn it over to Dr. Beta. Great. So our first presentation that we always do is our indicators of success, and I'll turn that over to our assistant superintendent, um, Sarah Kent. Thank you. Everybody see the indicators? Sorry, let me put them at the top. Yes. Great. All right. Um, so good evening, everyone. Um, tonight I'll be presenting on our monthly indicators, but also our quarterly updates, um, and then our usual annual, um, I'm sorry, our usual appendix of uh, relevant data. So I'm going to start on page three, which is our attendance. So as you can see, we've continued to be successful in having students rem um, attend remote uh, school. In grades three and four, we are actually over our uh, target of 95%. In grades K, one, two, five, six, seven, eight, nine, we are over 90%. And grades 10 through 12, we are over 80% with our lowest 
<clears throat> being in grade 12. And that's something I've been reading about throughout the, the nation that it's really hard to engage our seniors right now. Um, this, we are at 91.8, um, which is only slightly below where we were last year in February year to date when we were 92.6. So we are due this, this represents a lot of hard work and a lot of outreach um, by our educators throughout the district. Now I'm gonna to turn to page four and I have, Um, the first indicator, indicator number three here, I just wanted to remark that the nonsense word fluency uh, test is one that is given to kindergarten students one-on-one. -on -one. It's really not remote friendly. So we have not been using that assessment this year in our remote learning. However, we have been very closely tracking kindergarten progress. Don't worry, we've been using our imagined learning data as well as other data to really um, robustly know what kids are learning. And uh, they're doing a great job in oral fluency and vocabulary. For quarter two, um, the grades of fourth grade students, um, you'll see that we have increased in each subject um, with the exception of math, that's very close to where it was. Um, but you'll also really be pleased to hear that we are within 5% of last year of each of these. So our, although the grade, they look low, you have to remember that in fourth grade, there are only, in, third, in fourth grade, there's only four grades you can get, a one, a two, a three, or a four. And this is counting the percentage of kids who got a three or a four. Many, many of the kids who are not represented here have twos. There are very, very few ones. Moving on to eighth grade. Um, you will see that we've had gains in writing and science in eighth grade, um, while ELA has remained pretty the same, and math has actually dropped a few points. Again, though, when you compare this to last year's second quarter grades, which was pre-pandemic, right, we had the, these grades right before we went out, um, we had, they are very comparable to last year. Actually in math, we were at 66%. Um, in um, science, they, we, they were, were actually a little higher right now than we were last year. Um, and ELA were, were equal. Again, this is representing a lot of work on our educators part um, to hold kids accountable um, and also just deliver such high quality education through a computer. Um, so for the dropouts, this um, month we have had nine additional students added to our dropouts, but you can see that our rate is about a third of what it was last year at this time. Right now we're at a dropout rate of 1.73. Last year at this time we're at 4.6, and if you go back through the years, you can see that at this time we're generally We've generally been in the fours and we're at 1.73 right now, which is remarkable. Of the students that have dropped out though, this is sort of the detail down here, you'll see that as per usual or what we've been seeing the trend is that many, many of those students are L's. So 20 of the 27 have been L's. On the next page, sorry, trying to, there we go. You can see the details here. So of the nine that have withdrawn, um, seven were L's. One was both L and a student with disability, a duly identified student. And it spread across the grades with the most being in grade 11. Our mobility is low <laughs> again. Um, when you compare it to last, right now we have about total, about um, 795 kids that have come or gone this year. Um, last year we had over a thousand at this time. And you'll see that our, we've, we've remained fairly equal, our ins and our outs. You know, we had 29 in and 31 out. Um, it's, it's remaining pretty constant, although we had 60 kids come and go. Last year, right now we're at 13.4% uh, mobility. Last year at this time we were at 16. 
0.2. And then finally, um, high school, um, you can see that in ninth grade, the number of the percentage of students who are failing at least one class has increased, which is not good and we're working hard on that, but you can see the good news is that the number of students who are failing multiple classes has decreased a bit. So the number of kids that are failing only one class has increased. In, uh, in the 10th grade, <clears throat> the, you can see that the percentage of students who have failed a class or more than one class has remained fairly constant. However, the news isn't as good in that we have a, more students that are failing more classes um, and less students who are failing only one class. So I'm happy to take any questions that anyone may have. I will also just say on this high school data that this is about between nine and 14% of where we were last year at this time. Um. I have a quick question, um, and this is just more uh, just because I'm not sure how this works around attendance. Um, I, I was on a Facebook group somewhere and someone from Chelsea was commenting that, uh, you know, one of the attendance officers went to their house um, to, to like ask about the, their students' attendance and the parents said that, um, you know, they hadn't received a call or anything up prior to that. So I'm, I, I'm just curious, like, how does that work? And, and you know, just, just so that I have an understanding of, like, how that whole system works around, like, following up with students who are missing from class. I was wondering if you could just, like, give me, a, like, a quick overview of that. Um, I can have Assistant Superintendent Delady answer that question. Oh, sure. Thank you. Sure, yeah, so home visits happen on a, on a regular basis. It's, it's usually one of the last things we do when, when phones or emails aren't working. So in, in the case that you're hearing about, I'm guessing it's a process of maybe a phone number was changed and it wasn't updated with the school, um, whatever email was working wasn't working. Um, and my guess is that it's probably that we hadn't seen the kid for a couple of days and without any response, it's, you know, uh, the, the idea is to make sure that our kids are, are, are well. So my guess is it was partly a wellness check. Um, but yeah, we, uh, we do that every now and then when, we're, when we don't have any information about a kid or where he is. Um, so we want to make sure we um, check on them. Does that answer it? Yeah, no, that, that makes perfect sense. And it, 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 it's, I'm sure that that was happening, right? It's just like, I, I just like, hadn't ever thought through that process. So thanks for clearing that up for me. Any other questions? Yes, Chairwoman Garcia. Uh, I had a quick question for Sarah, just related to her report. Um, Sarah, thank you for sharing your the update. Um, I just wanted to ask if it's okay if you can just share a little bit about, come back to the point. I wanna make sure I understood correctly. Um, did you say that more students are filling multiple classes? Um, that that very last section that I think you covered, I just wanted to come back to that and make sure I heard it correctly. Sure. Um, compared to one class, I think it was like multiple classes. Yeah. So that's at the high school. Um, and looking at one one of our metrics is grade nine and grade ten passing rates. Um, so you can see in this chart. So for the ninth graders, the percentage of students who are failing one, two, three, or four classes, right, is 48.2. You can see, though, that from last quarter, we had only, we had 62 students failing one class. Now we have 89 students failing one class, and we had 14 students failing four classes, and we only have seven now. So although the percentage of students failing has increased, the number of classes that they're failing has decreased for ninth grade. Does that make sense? Yes, I actually had it wrong, so I'm glad I asked. No, no, Thank no, you. you don't have it wrong for 10th grade. <laughs> so for 10th grade, you're, you're right. So the actual percentage of kids failing stayed fairly, um, very similar, right? It's only off by 0.2. However, if you look at the number of kids failing one class, there are less kids failing one class, but there's more kids failing three or four classes in 10th grade. So sort of the number of kids failing hasn't changed, but they, as you said, in your, when you were asking your question, there are more 
kids failing more classes in 10th grade only. So if you recall, um, last time we reported last month, we did put some processes and systems in place to improve our failure rates at the high school. And we caught it early after the first nine weeks. And we did put an improvement plan in place. Yes, and we are working on some very creative credit recovery options um, that aren't, they're still being baked, um, but we are being creative and creating some new programs. The high school administration has been working hard on some ideas. And thank you. <clears throat> thank you for clarifying. I know that the, the issue again, that you know has probably been uh, across our radars and in the community, um, you know, we have personally, and you know, obviously you've heard this from uh, Roberto as well, about like pushing back against the MCAS and testing and really just thinking about like student experience right now, their learning experience given the conditions of COVID and, and virtual that's out of the norm. Um, why I just, you know, wanted to flag that as something to watch too, because um, we want to make sure that we're really understanding our students' needs, especially their learning um, needs and, and, and just to think about testing on top of that right now. So um, thank you, Almi, for sharing about the improvement plan and for, you know, for all of you just really um, you know, sort of like zoning in on that right now and something to watch. And thank you, Sarah. Any other questions? Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Kent. Team, do I have a motion to go out of order to vote on the Chelsea Administra Administrators Association contract? Motion, so moved. <laughs> Motion to that. <laughs> um, yeah. Wait. Do I have a second? Second. Great. Uh, so team, we are simply going to quickly go out of order um, and vote on on the uh, collective bargaining bargaining agreement. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and read that portion on the agenda under number eight under new business. Consideration and action to vote on the collective bargaining agreement between the Chelsea School Committee and the Chelsea Administrators Association for the period of July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2021. Explanation, the Chelsea School Committee approves the collective bargaining agreement between so the Chelsea School Committee. Vice Chair? I'm sorry, is there a question? I think Rosemary had her mic on for a second. Oh, got it. Okay. Uh, where was I? Okay. Um, including amendments sent forth, set forth in the memorandum of agreement ratified by the Chelsea. Boy, <laughs> sorry, team. by the Chelsea Administrators Association on February 17th, 2021. Roll call. Roll call. Chair, hold on, Chairwoman Garcia, uh, I think I have to do the presentation first. So team, I think, uh, and Dr. Beta, jump in here if I have this incorrect, uh, for due to Mr. Ambrosino being here, um, I really, I think, we should move it up um, so that he can attend other meetings. Um. <laughs> what we do is Christine has a very short but three page presentation on just the contract and information about the contract, and then you would take the vote. And it, I misinterpreted that. All right, so sorry okay. team. Okay, go ahead, Christine. All right, I promise this will be very painless <laughs> and quick. Um, so we, um, it took us a little while to get to this point. Sorry, let me just go to my screen. Um, for the administr Chelsea Administrators Association, which we call CAA. And so I will go through a little bit of what we did and um, just run through it for your vote tonight. And this is the last of our negotiation contracts for, for SY, for this uh, school year. <laughs> Um, I won't go through all of this because you've seen this before, but ultimately these are the guiding pillars that 
Um, we went through with all of our contracts, including all the CTU contracts. This is the negotiation team. Um, you can see these were the representatives from the CAA side. And these were the representatives from the school committee, representing the school committee. The major highlights for the CAA contract include, um, ultimately, this is a one-year agreement. There's a few housekeeping items we agreed on. Um, a few additions were the maternity, paternity adoptive leave, uh, which we made consistent with our CTU contracts. Um, the domestic violence leave um, language of allowing 15 sick days if um, someone needs to use this time. And then uh, NACA members, if they uh, do not complete four years, then they will owe the district 50% of their tuition reimbursement. And, and this is more to in incentivize people to stay longer with their district if they do um, take courses that the district uh, does pay for because we want to help her with retention and keep um, staff um, in Chelsea. And ultimately with the salary schedule, we uh, will raise their salary. Um, we'll backdate it to July 1st, the 1.5% salary increase that's consistent with our CTU. And then um, this month we will uh, do an additional 1% increase. And, some of these dates don't really make sense because it took us a little bit longer to get this ratified. And so um, we'll be working with the CT CAA to make sure we communicate with their members when their um, salaries will increase. And just to quickly um, highlight again, the Maternity Paternity of Adoptive Leave Act it was huge for us, um, allowing 12 weeks of paid time off um, if, if they have the time and we we want to make sure we highlight that because it goes with our culture of care that Dr. Abita has um, emphasized. And so we're at the point where we can go to a vote and, um, and then the contract will be ratified. But any questions before we do that? All right, great. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. Can you do a roll call? Yes. Consideration and action to vote on the collective bargaining agreement between the Chelsea School Committee and the Chelsea Administrators Association for the period of July 1, 2020, July, I'm sorry, through June 30th, 2021. Ms. Enriquez? Yes. Ms. Santiago? Yes. Mr. Jimenez Rivera? Yes. Ms. Alfaro? Yes. Ms. Garcia Mirza? Yes. Mr. Wilson? Yes. Ms. Carlisle? Yes. Mr. Ambrosino? Yes. That's eight votes in the affirmative and two absent. That's eight in the affirmative, two absences. All right, team, do I have a motion to go back into order? Sorry for the confusion. <laughs> Is there a second? Second. Great. <clears throat> right, Dr. Beta, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Let me share my screen again. Okay. So um, at our at several months ago, we added the COVID-19 updates to every school committee meeting as a section. So the updates today, there's two updates. The first is just verbally, I wanted to let you know, per our memorandum of agreement with the Chelsea Teachers Union in September 2020, meetings have begun to address working conditions related to hybrid and in-person models. And then the next presentation I have, which is very exciting, is our COVID-19 testing pilot presentation that Adam Delady is overseeing. And we're very excited about this because we'll be starting it very soon. So I'm going to turn it over to Assistant Superintendent Delady to share our good news. Assistant. 
All right, thank you, Dr. Abeda. Um, so we are extremely excited to share this information with you. Uh, and I'll just, a quick agenda, Dr. Abeda will do some framing and she's gonna give a little bit of history on uh, some work we've done in, in the Safer Teachers, Safer Schools Coalition. Uh, we'll share the goals of, of the testing program. We'll talk about the what, the why, the how, the where, the when, and the who. Um, and then we'll take some questions and answers and I anticipate we'll have some. Uh, so before we move on, um, Dr. Abeda, would you like to provide a little bit of history in terms of how we came to this program? Sure. So back in October, I was invited to be part of the Safer Teacher, Safer Schools Coalition, and uh, they had reached out to actually Chelsea and Revere and a couple other school districts, Wellesley, Watertown, and uh, Somerville, a couple others. And they said, hey, would you be interested in being part of this collaborative? It's for COVID-19 testing. Um, and so I, I joined because I thought, well, I, I really want to learn more about this. And even though we weren't ready to reopen, I thought it would be wise to, to learn from the other school systems who were already um, open. For example, Wellesley has been open since day one of the school year. So they put this COVID-19 pilot uh, testing pilot in place. So all along for the last months, I've been learning um, about their testing pilot and attending these meetings, just waiting for the day when we would be able to someday implement COVID-19 testing. Uh, so they were influential in my really wanting to do this. And then I wanted to, uh, when Desi came out with their pilot program, initially they had said, this is only for for school systems that are in-person learning, so we didn't really qualify for it, but we were able to, to make the case because we do have students in our online learning centers that we could be part of the pilot. So they allowed us to be part of the pilot. And so at that moment when we submitted the application, I we were able to take it from there. So I'll just turn it back over to Adam to share since he's the one that took it over from there. All right, thank you. Yeah, and first off, I, I just wanna point out that this is the result of, you know, as Dr. Abeda said, uh, the support and advocacy from lots of people outside of our district, um, but also the work of a lot of people inside of our district, particularly our, our nurses, our nurses aides, our, our health department in general um, has been working almost around the clock, studying and researching and learning the testing protocols. It, it really is a lot of information and a lot of work. So they have my appreciation and I know they have all of yours. Uh, so the, we have three goals with our testing program. Um, and the first first and foremost, it's, it's really about creating peace of mind for our stakeholders, our students, our staff, our families, um, our administrators in, in being able to come back to school knowing that we're doing everything we can to keep things safe. Um, the second goal is, and, and it's equally as important, uh, is to decrease transmission of this virus, particularly in our schools, but also this will help in our community as well. Um, and also, lastly, uh, this is going to give us even more data and information on the prevalence of the virus in our school community. So what is pool testing? Um, so pool testing is it's actually a very cost efficient way to test large numbers of people. So rather than pay per person, we are essentially pooling together or grouping together, say 10 test samples into one test. So we only get charged one tenth of the price, um, which is really significant when we're testing larger number of people. But I think it's important to point out that you know, no one mitiga mitigation strategy on its own is going to be effective. I've come to learn to like this little um, analogy of Swiss cheese, because each slice of Swiss cheese has some holes in it. But if you stack them up, um, all of those holes end up getting covered by the other slices. Um, so testing in schools is, is yet another slice of Swiss cheese on the um, pile of mitigation strategies of cheese, if you will. Um, pool testing, what it does most importantly is, as we all know, uh, the dangers of this virus are that people can walk around without knowing that they have it being what we call asymptomatic, meaning they don't feel sick, but they're still carrying the, the virus. 
Um, this identifies those asymptomatic cases, and that's, I think, a key factor in stopping the spread within our schools and also our communities. Um, It'll build confidence and trust in the safety of our school buildings. It will help us understand the prevalence of the virus in our schools. It's going to encourage the importance of safety measures outside of school and in the home. And also it'll help us prepare for and accelerate the return to full in-person schooling, which I know many of us are um, hoping and praying for. And why are we considering this? Well, uh, number one, it's going to give us peace of mind. It is cost effective. It will help in decreasing the transmission. It gives us data. And most importantly, ultimately, it will save lives. So how it works, um, basically, the student or the staff member um, uses what we call an anterior swab. And so what that means is it's not the long one that seemingly looks like it's going to go into your brain. It just goes at the very outside edge of your nostril. It's extremely pain-free, nothing to worry about. And, you know, you rub it around each nostril twice, and then it goes into this little tube right here. Um, and we put about 10 samples in a tube. And then people go back about their business. They go back to class. They go back to their jobs. Uh, and then our staff will then package up all of those samples and send them to a lab in Cambridge um, at the Broad Institute. They, within 48 hours, but usually more like 24 hours, they'll get results to us. And uh, if, it's, if there's nobody negative in the pool, if the pool comes up negative, no news is good news. However, if we do find out there's a positive pool, then we look at our records to say, hey, pool three tested positive. So that means all the people in pool three now need to be what we call reflex tested, which means that we're gonna now test each person in that pool individually. Um, so we would call them back. If we get the results while people are in school, we'll bring them down. If it's, we get the results at night, we'll call you and say, please come first thing in the morning or at your convenience, and we will individually test each person. And then we're going to find out, are you the positive person or not? If you're the negative person, you go back about your business. If you're the positive person, that will trigger us to follow our typical um, safety protocols and contact tracing, just as we have been doing all along. So how does it work? It's an anterior nasal swab, which is the short swab um, done at the front of the nostril. It actually can be administered um, by adults, by themselves um, and older children, anyone grades two and up. Um, but if kids need help with it, our, our staff will be um, available to do it for them. But anyone grade two and up uh, can do it to themselves under supervision. Uh, it, can, it can also be an administered by any trained school staff. It doesn't need to be a medical staff. Um, consent forms are a requirement, so no one can participate unless they complete a consent form. The information that um, we have for positive results does need to be reported, but it will be transmitted uh, via a, uh, the provided technology from DESI, which is secure and compliant with all data privacy laws. Um, and lastly, I do want to stress um, that this is optional. No one is uh, required to participate in this program. However, I do want to stress that the more people that do it, the safer our schools are going to be. So we really do highly encourage people to take part and participate. And if you're unsure or you have questions, please reach out because um, we really feel that this is one of the most important slices of Swiss cheese, if you will, to get our schools back up and running. So when and where will this take place? Um, beginning in March, and actually as early as uh, next week, we will be conducting some testing. Um, after this presentation, we'll, we'll be, we will be communicating um, to our school and administrators and all staff uh, to let them know about the program with uh, more detailed information, as well as uh, sharing the consent forms to be filled out. So we'll be collecting the consent forms early next week. Once we have them in place, then we will start setting up people to get tested. Um, we're starting at our middle school and high school buildings because essentially that's where our students are right now, um, at least the ones in the remote learning center. Um, and we're gonna do sort of a slow rollout. So it'll be just the people that are in the buildings, including the remote learning center kids now. This will prepare us to have systems in place to expand that testing to all schools once we're conducting um, 
forms of in-person instruction. So who can participate? Any student or staff member in our middle school and high school buildings. So basically any human being who sets foot in our buildings can participate as long as they complete that consent form. Um, the elementary schools and the early learning center, they're gonna be added to the program once we're able to move to other forms of in-person instruction. However, we are working on options to include the staff that are currently coming into those buildings, um, but they may need to come over to one of those other testing sites. We're still working that out, but we are uh, not forgetting about our elementary and early learning center staff. Um, they will have the opportunity to participate. So in summary, um, and then I'll take some questions, um, the things to really take away from this are we will be starting some pooled testing beginning next week, um, and we'll phase it in, uh, and we'll, we'll build our capacity as the numbers of people coming into our buildings hopefully increases. Um, I want to stress it is optional. No one is required to participate. I should also say it's completely free of charge. Uh, DESE is uh, taking care of the cost all the way through April 18th and hopefully they'll extend that. But if not, we will use um, grant funding that is uh, dedicated to uh, COVID specific mitigations um, uh, after April 18th. It's a nasal swab, it's not a saliva, and it's not the long one. It's a nice pain-free option that people can do themselves. And members of positive pools will be called back to conduct reflex testing. Um, and if that is an inconvenient option for reflex testing, people can also take, um, uh, take the other options where you can do free testing, uh, PCR testing within the city or elsewhere. Um, and just ultimately, we believe this will greatly increase uh, safety while decreasing transmission in our schools and our community. So with that, I am happy to take any questions. Adam, Rosemary Carlisle. I have a question. Does that mean everybody who enters our Chelsea Public School has to be tested? Anyone who enters our buildings may be tested if they complete the consent form, but it is not a requirement by any means. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm going to say just to add to that, districts who have testing in place have um, at the voluntarily, they're about at 80%. Yeah, this is Marisol. I had a couple questions. Um, uh, and thank you, Adam, because I know you explained this to us on another meeting before and went into more detail. Um, and we appreciate that. I just got off another call talking about, you know, how we in the in, in the state are trying to push vaccine distribution and we don't want to neglect the importance of testing simultaneously. Um, so just seeing us have access to additional testing um, in the city is always a plus. Um, and given that we are, for all the reasons you listed here, you know, wanting to be safe and and think about like how we're uh, making things more accessible for our community is always like a good thing here um, on my on my end. Um, I did wanna ask a little bit, just a quick, I guess a tiny question around um, what are you learning about the efficiency of these tests? And uh, for folks that don't know what reflex testing is, if you don't mind just sharing um, just a couple of uh, details on that. And that's, that's pretty much all I had. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, so the, the language um, is surveillance testing is what sort of we're calling the first round. So that's the nasal swab that we're using. Um, that's, that goes into the pool. Um, when we talk about reflex testing, there are different ways to do it. The DESI program that we're participating in uses um, what we're calling um, a rapid antigen test. Um, and that is um, done by, uh, created by a company called Abbott Binex Now. Um, and essentially it's another anterior swab, uh, but what happens is you take the swab, you put it in this little, um, I, don't, I don't know what kind of science goes into it, but it goes into this little folded piece of paper and kind of works like other tests where one line means positive and two lines mean negative um, or vice versa. So uh, it goes in there and within 15 minutes, you're gonna get a result. In terms of the accuracy, 
Um, the first round surveillance uh, is what we call a PCR test, and that's essentially 100% accurate, accurate or 99.99% accurate. So if there is a positive sample in the pool, it will be detected, and we will know that one of those 10 swabs comes from someone who had COVID, uh, positive for COVID-19. For the rapid antigen test, it depends on what we call the viral load. So if someone has a high viral load, what that means is that they're more highly contagious and more likely to spread the disease. So the rapid antigen test, the accuracy correlates with the viral load. So in other words, the higher the viral load, the more accurate the test is. So it's essentially 98 to 99% accurate with uh, people who have uh, high viral loads. It also takes into account if you're symptomatic or not. Um, on the low end, based on the research, um, if you are asymptomatic with an extremely low viral load, the test would only be 70% accurate. Um, but based on everything that the Department of Public Health has told us, told us that they are confident that the, um, even with that low incidence of 70%, the people that are low viral loads and asymptomatic have virtually no chance of spreading the virus anyway. Um, so they, they are backing the Abbott Binex now rapid antigen test um, as a safe um, option for reflex testing. So I hope that answers your question, Marisol. Yes, it did perfectly. Um, and then, sorry, this is, this is definitely the last question, forgive me. Um, the storage and management of testing on our school buildings, um, who would be overseeing that? And, you know, how, how do you feel about like the storage of all these things and like how that the, sort of like the logisticals of like having this in our schools? How are you guys yeah. doing? Thank you for that. Actually, we have, um, so I am working in conjunction with Denise Ferrari DeResta, who is our health manager. Um, and we have used some of our grant funding to, um, hire, and we're in the process of hiring actually, um, one district testing coordinator who will oversee, you know, she'll work directly with Denise and I and me, um, but she will coordinate with uh, three grade level coordinators. So we're going to have a high school coordinator, a middle school coordinator, and an elementary and early learning coordinator. So there's four sort of leadership positions uh, that will be working with Denise and me um, to be able to oversee all of the logistics and support and data entry and, um, you know, reaching out to the courier to pick up the samples when they're ready, um, entering the data, scanning all of the tubes, all that stuff. So that'll all be worked out. Um, we do have, um, we really do have some high, we're lucky, high quality health suites in our district. Um, and, we will be storing the, you know, testing materials in those suites. But I think Marisol, you're getting at what are we doing with the actual like materials as we're using them. So we do have proper protocols to follow around disposal of materials. Um, for example, as people come up to the table to get tested, you have to blow your nose first. So now we're dealing with, you know, blowing your nose, putting the tissue in the, in the receptacle, making sure we're sanitizing our hands. So there's this whole assembly line of steps. Um, but there are very strict protocols on what we're doing with the with the actual like waste materials as well as um, handling the swabs. You know, even with shipping, there are really detailed um, rules around how we ship them. So they have to be like in three different layers. So the first layer is the tube. The second layer is a little baggie that the tube goes into. The third layer is a bigger baggie that all the tubes go into. Then it goes into a bigger box. Um, so it's, and then we have to mark that box as, um, it, it, there's a special code that I, I forget, but it's like N with a bunch of numbers, which means something in this box could be you know, a contaminant. Um, so there, there's lots of stuff in terms of keeping this stuff safe and um, we are totally on top of making sure that happens. Thank you so much for sharing that outline and for all your work on this um, and all the people that will be involved. Um, please let us know how we can support. Thank you for that, Adam. question um also it feels like uh this this box in a in a bag in a bag in a bag it's like a russian doll of biohazard waste <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um so my question is 
so you know given that the the pcr test is so accurate and the other is less so what happens if we have a pool test that comes back positive but then we do all the all the reflex testing and everybody comes back negative what's the, the process at that point yeah great question um and that actually is something that is occurring every now and then um and so what what just to summarize what you're asking so the pcr test is 100 percent accurate and it says hey somebody in this pool is positive then we go back and give everybody the reflex test and you get all negative results that might happen um, and there's a number of reasons why. Number one, remember when you take a COVID test, it is a snapshot in time. So it's possible that you are positive on Monday and no longer positive on Wednesday when you take the reflex test. That's one way. Another thing is that you were positive because you had a low viral load and that doesn't come up on the, um, the rapid antigen test. So um, what there's two options and right now we're um, working on both options, but one option is to do the buy next now again. Um, and according to the guidance from DPH, if you do the reflex testing twice and everybody comes up negative both times, we're good to go. The risk is negligible and we don't have to worry about it. But we also have the option of paying a little bit extra, which right now Desi would be paying a little extra, but so we're, we're all good with that. Um, so pay a little extra and do both the buy next now and an individual PCR. So we're going to pilot that option to start. So um, if we do get that negative, we'll have the PCR tests. So we'll have to reflex everybody again, which will be a bit inconvenient for people, but hopefully un people understand that it's worth that risk because we want to get it right. So if it does come up negative, we're going to have a store of individual PCRs, which are you know, much more expensive, um, but we're ready to do it that way as well. So um, we're opting on the more safe side with that. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? All right. No. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Adam. I probably have a bunch, but I'll email you. <laughs> I have to I like the info. I would just like to thank um, Mr. Delady and his team for their hard work. As you can tell, he's extremely knowledgeable about COVID-19 testing now. And um, thank you to our former uh, principal math coach, now uh, Dr. PhD uh, Delady. Uh, we have been stretched in many directions as a result of this pandemic, each of us on this team. And we learn and we grow. And I tell you, we learn something new every single day as a result of this. And I just want to thank Adam for his uh, flexibility and willing to jump in and do this. Um, so thank you, uh, Mr. Delaney, for you and your team's work on this, making our dreams come true with COVID-19 testing. Um, we're excited about it. So next, uh, we normally have our student representative and his up an update. Is, is he here? He's not here, but he sent me um, a statement to read. Oh, okay. Great, great. So um, Richard, Richard Flores couldn't be here tonight. He wanted to um, apologize for that and said he'll see everyone at the next meeting. Uh, a couple updates he had is that um, students in the high school are essentially working on getting graduation and senior events, hoping to plan everything in person. Uh, his second update was more students are getting into colleges like Dartmouth, Boston University, all the UMasses and others, as well as getting good scholarships. And his third and last update, was sports is the hottest topic right now with the opening of hybrid models in cities like Everett, Revere, Somerville, and Malden, and MIAA approving sports for mass. It brought to the students' attention Chelsea's undecided decision regarding our sports. I wrote a lengthy email to Dr. Beta. I apologize for not responding, but I was meeting with staff to get, um, wait, I'm, Missed that part, sorry. Uh, although all student athletes are willing to go back, a few educators aren't. I hope the accessibility of vaccines for educators at CVS makes it more comfortable for everyone to go back at least some variant of, um, of a hybrid model. 
I hope that it doesn't intervene with sports. And if there's an alternative for teachers to teach from home, also the chance of having conditioning training as a lot of students are out of shape and need to be back at full potential to make the best of the short sports season. But yes, sport is a big topic that we wish to bring back. Thank you, Veronica. Richard, we will see you next meeting. Thank you for submitting your comments. So responsible of you, I love that. <laughs> um, thank you, Dr. Arbita, for queuing up the agenda. The next portion is our personnel updates. And I will scroll down. Okay, so here is our personnel changes since um, February. And you can see that our demographic data is 22% uh, uh, Caucasian, 50% Irish Hispanic, 14% Black, and Asian Pacific Islander, 14%. You can see the resignations, retirements, terminations, and then promotions and leaves of absences. And then in closure C is our enrollment report. Our enrollment report is steady at 6,000, so we haven't changed too much this year. Um, normally, we our enrollment is at 6,200, and uh, but we're staying we're staying steady at 6,042. Um, so I would like to commend these reports to the uh, to these the personnel and the enrollment report to the record. Thank you, Dr. Abid. Any questions from the school committee? All righty, moving right along to new business. We can skip right over the first one as we already completed that one. Next up, we have consideration and action to accept $5,000 from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education for the Growing Literacy Equity Across America, Massachusetts grant. Explanation, this grant will be used to support a team that will develop a proposal for the GLEAM grant that will be submitted to DESE this spring. GLEAM funding is intended to support deep and lasting improvements to schools multi-layered, I'm sorry, multi-tiered system of support for literacy. Funds will be used for stipends and support of the planning team during school year 2020 and 2021. Roll call. Consideration and action to accept $5,000 from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education for the Growing Literacy Equity Across America, Massachusetts grant. Ms. Enriquez? Yes. Ms. Santiago? Ms. Santiago? Yes, yeah, yeah, sorry, I'm stuck here, yes. Mr. Jimenez? Yes. Ms. Alfaro? Yes. Ms. Garcia Mirza? Yes. Mr. Wilson? Yes. Ms. Carlisle? Yes. That's seven in the affirmative and two absent. Motion carries. Next up we have consideration and action to accept $9,335 from DESI for the Teen Pregnancy Prevention Partners for Youth Success Grant. Explanation. This is the fifth and final year of the, TT, of the TPP grant, which supports districts in implementing and sustaining evidence-based teen pregnancy prevention programs in middle schools. Funds will be used for stipends for professional development, instructional materials, conferences, and other expenses in support of the program for school year 2020-2021. Massachusetts General Law Chapter 71, Section 37A provides for the acceptance of grants only with the approval of the Chelsea School Committee. Roll call. Consideration and action to accept $9,335 from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education for the Teen Pregnancy Prevention Partners for Youth Success Grant. Ms. Enriquez? Yes. Ms. Santiago? Yes. Mr. Jimenez? Yes. Ms. Alfaro? Yes. Ms. Garcia? Yes. Mr. Wilson? Yes. Ms. Carlisle? Yes. 
With seven in the affirmative and two absent. Motion carries. Next up, we have consideration and action to accept a gift of $12,000 from the Bully Goldsmith Family Charitable Account for the Chelsea Opportunity Academy. Explanation. Elizabeth Bully and Brian Goldsmith are private individuals who have learned about the goals of the Chelsea Opportunity Academy and would like to support its ongoing efforts. Their donation is to generally support the school as needed. Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 71, Section 37A, provides for the acceptance of gifts only with the approval of the Chelsea School Committee. Roll call. Madam Chair, I have a question before we move yes. forward. Um, is, this, um, is this gift um, unrestricted or are there any particular restrictions that we need to, beyond, beyond just that, that they be used for the uh, COA? Um, I will turn that over to Ms. Monica Lamboy. Thank you for the questions. The donors did not put any conditions on the funding other than it support Chelsea Opportunity Academy. Wonderful. Thank you. Roll call. Consideration and action to accept a gift of $12,000 from the Bewley Goldsmith Family Charitable Account for the Chelsea Opportunity Academy. Ms. Enriquez? Yes. Ms. Santiago? Yes. Mr. Jimenez? Yes. Ms. Alfaro? Yes. Ms. Garcia Mirza? Yes. Mr. Wilson? Yes. Ms. Carlisle? Yes. With seven in the affirmative and two absent. Motion carries. Next, we have consideration and action to accept $496,307.50 from DESE for the State Coronavirus Prevention Fund Program. Explanation, on January 7, 2021, the state legislator authorized $53 million for one-time grants to school districts, charter schools, and collaboratives to support coronavirus prevention efforts and maintain and increase educational quality during the pandemic. The funds must be fully expended by June 30th, 2021. The funds will be used for equipment and installation costs in support of enhanced classroom technology. Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 71 Section 37A provides for the acceptance of grants only with the approval of the Chelsea School Committee. Roll call. Consideration and action to accept $496,337.50 from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education for the State Coronavirus Prevention Fund Program. Ms. Enriquez? Yes. Ms. Santiago? Yes. Mr. Jimenez? Yes. Ms. Alfaro? Yes. Garcia Mirza? Yes. Mr. Wilson? Yes. Ms. Carlisle? Yes. Seven in the affirmative and two absent. Motion carries. Next up, we have consideration and action to approve a budget transfer in the amount of one million two hundred thousand dollars to move funds from benefits and payroll adjustments other instructional programs in Sokolowski Elementary School to technology services explanation savings are available in benefits and payroll adjustments due to some health benefit costs being transferred to grants and that salary con contingency is no longer needed now that nearly all bargaining agreements have been settled for the fiscal year Savings in other instructional programs is due to the reduction in the salary expenses for after-school programming, and savings are available at Sokolowski Elementary due to vacancy savings. The funds are being transferred to technology services for the purchase of software licenses, equipment, and other items in support of in-school and remote learning. Roll call. Pardon. Um, Ms. Garcia, what is the total? Is it 1200000 Yes. Consideration and action to approve a budget transfer in the amount of 1200000 to move funds from benefits and payroll adjustments, other instructional programs, and Sokolowski Elementary School to the technology services. Ms. Enriquez? Yes. Ms. Santiago? Yes. Mr. Jimenez? Yes. Ms. Alfaro? Yes. Ms. Garcia Mirza? Yes. Mr. Wilson? Yes. Ms. Carlisle? Yes. That's seven in the affirmative and two absent. Motion carries. 
For the next item, Dr. Beta, uh, we are postponing this item, right, to the next one, if I'm not mistaken? Correct. Correct. Okay, great. Next up, we have consideration and action to accept the resolution to recognize Elizabeth McBride Day in Chelsea Public Schools. I'd like to speak on this. Sure. Um, I will be reading the resolution. Okay. Go ahead, read the resolutions first. Go ahead. Wait. Thank you, Dr. Vega. The Chelsea School Committee hereby recognizes Elizabeth McBride Day for Chelsea Public Schools. Whereas Elizabeth McBride was born to John and Nellie Sullivan on February 6, 1921 in Cambridge, Massachusetts, one of six children and later moved to Chelsea, Massachusetts, where she spent the majority of her life. And whereas she met her husband, John McBride, at Chelsea High School, and they were married on July 3rd, 1943, and shared 68 years of marriage and welcomed eight children, 16 grandchildren and eight grandchildren and two great, great grandchildren. And whereas Elizabeth raised her family and worked actively in Chelsea politics. There she led a blue bird troop, was president of the PTA and became chair of the Chelsea School Committee and was a strong advocate for teachers and education. And whereas Elizabeth was a delegate of the Democratic Party and the first female member of the Kiwanis in Massachusetts and eventually received the NEA Lifetime Achievement Award. And whereas on February 6, 2021, Elizabeth reached the impressive age of 100 years. Now, therefore, we the Chelsea School Committee in recognition of this remarkable milestone do hereby proclaim Saturday, February 6, 2021 to be to be Elizabeth McBride Day. And we urge all members of Chelsea Public Schools and the Chelsea community, recognize this day and celebrate the life and achievements of Ms. McBride. Ms. Carlisle, would you like to speak on this before yes. we do a roll call? Yes, I would. Yes, I would like to speak on this because I put the set of resolutions in because for the younger members of the Chelsea School Committee, they don't know who Liz McBride is and who she was. She was quite a lady. She dedicated her her years to bringing up her children here in Chelsea, educating them here in Chelsea, and, and making sure all the students in the city of Chelsea were well-educated. Well she fought for the rights of the teachers. She fought for the rights of the students. If there was something wrong, Liz was always there to fix it. As you all know that Liz passed away this week, um, her wake was today, and we, we will truly miss this woman in the community of Chelsea. There should be more women like Liz on the school committee and in the active community of education. My prayers are with her family, all her children that I knew quite well. I grew up with them. And may she rest in peace. And I want to thank you guys for letting me bring this resolution to the table. Thank you, Ms. Carlisle. Before running, uh, or before casting a vote, are there any questions about this resolution? Great. I just have a quick question. It, oh, it, so okay. we're recognizing Elizabeth McBride Day on February 6, 2021, which already already passed? Or is it on her birthday, which has come? I don't know when her 100th birthday would have been. So I'm, I'm just curious what we're actually, like wh when are we actually recognizing the day? Her birthday was on February 6. Okay, this set okay. of resolutions wasn't presented because we were waiting for the school committee meeting to come up. 
and sadly to say that she passed away before we could read the set of resolutions. But her birthday was on February 6th. Got it. So I guess we were retro retroactively calling the... Okay, got it. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you for clarifying, Ms. Carlisle. All right, Veronica, may we have a roll call, please? Um, excuse me, Madam Chair, I also have another question. Go ahead, Ms. Santiago. Just in terms of precedence, um, and thank you, Rosemary, for sharing all this background about who Elizabeth Mc, uh, McBride was and her contributions. Um, just as a point of uh, understanding here, when we say naming um, this day, February 6th, the Elizabeth McBride Day in honor of her contributions, is this like... Uh, for the Chelsea Public Schools, or is this a resolution that we're honoring for the an opportunity to lift her her contributions and who she was to the city? Um, this isn't this isn't like on our school calendar, right? Like this is no. uh, just trying to understand in terms of process for. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and thank you, Rosemary. Thank you, um, Kelly. Hmm. Thank you, Veronica. Consideration and action to accept the resolution to recognize Elizabeth McBride Day in Chelsea Public Schools. Ms. Enriquez? Yes. Ms. Santiago? Yes. Mr. Jimenez? Yes. Ms. Alfaro? Yes. Ms. Garcia Mirza? Yes. Mr. Wilson? Yes. Ms. Carlisle? Yes. That's seven in the affirmative and two absent. Motion carries. Team, before um, heading to communications, we do have to go back to the agenda under, um, not new business, but under one of our action items to see if we can approve the subcommittee minutes. So is there a motion to accept the subcommittee minutes? Motion to accept the subcommittee reports. Is there a second? I second it. Thank you. Great. Are there any communication pieces from the team? Well, I want to thank everybody for participating in the Black History Month celebration events that we had last month. It was a great, successful four events. So thank everybody for participating. And I um, just want to congratulate everybody again for being recognized uh, at our final event on the 24th of uh, February. So thank you guys for being a part of Black History Month again here in our great city. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. I have another announce uh, or a quick Mr. shout out, I guess. Um, I just want to quickly shout out um, Richard Flores, um, our one of our student representatives, and Brandon Garcia, who both spoke at the um, uh, at the last city council meeting. Actually, it might have been two meetings ago at this point um, uh, in, in favor of a uh, um, removing the the Columbus statue that was sitting in the in in, in Chelsea Square, um, you know, it's I know that that it's something that they had um, the high schoolers have been had been working a long time on, and so I just want to you know just thank them for their continued advocacy and for, for continuing to participate um, in in our community um, to to elevate the issues that um, you know that are important to our students. Um, so yeah, shout out to them. Okay, I have at this time. I'd like to do a moment of silence for a couple of residents who passed away in the city of Chelsea. Uh, Barbara Melvin, she was active in the senior center, and Miss Liz McBride, who, who you all know, was a member of the Chelsea School Committee. I'd like to have a moment of silence for both ladies. Thank you. Any other announcements? Actually, I, I would like to echo Roberto. Um, Brandon, I remember, spoke at our meeting maybe two years ago when we um, were talking about rem or replacing Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day. So I just want to applaud all of our students that advocated uh, and continue to advocate at such a young age. 
I'd also like to remind uh, school committee members to turn in their acknowledgement pages for state compliance. Please email them to Veronica. Awesome. Um, Ms. Garcia, I just wanted to share with the community that, um, you know, we've been really, really grateful. When, you know, we recently had our community budget conversation. Um, and I want to thank Dr. Albeda for her continued process on this. Um, and for continuing to honor the voices of the community in the way that I think all of us have been committed to. Um, in that note, you know, as we continue to hear more about vaccine distribution and, you know, of course, you know, hearing um, Adam present on, you know, testing being available in our community that, you know, to continue to reach out to us or other folks in the city, um, if you need more information about these things, um, you know, while I continue to see the spike, you know, I think a couple of weeks ago we had 200 positive cases and then it dropped to 18, then it dropped to three, uh, you know, that we continue to practice, um, you know, safety as much as possible and, you know, to continue to look out for each other so that we can all continue to make uh, significant improvement in the city of Chelsea, what that means for vulnerable populations that, you know, otherwise are, have been extremely affected by COVID. Um, so please continue to reach out to people, even if it's, you know, not your local school committee member, but anybody in the city, um, if you need information about, you know, testing sites um, and also, you know, about uh, the vaccine. Um, and also just really grateful to hear that the state is also prioritizing teachers making vaccines available. It's a huge, a huge gift as well for people that are very eager. Um, so just grateful for the collective work that everybody's been doing so that we can continue to move forward together as a city, so thank you. Thank you, Ms. Santiago. I'd also like to announce a personal initiative that I'm doing. Um, I would love to pass out Easter baskets uh, the last week of March in the food pantry, at the food pantry. So if you are um, open and willing to join me in stuffing the eggs and creating uh, the baskets, email me, um, I will be sending out a, a flyer this week. So thanks in advance. Alrighty team, I think that's it. Do I have a motion to adjourn? A motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Second. Great, have a good night everyone and stay safe. <laughs>